everyone. Welcome to our clinical trials and enrollment session. My name is Tracy Sandy Ali, Chief of Care Services for the ALS Association, Greater New York Chapter. It's my pleasure to introduce our guest speakers. Dr. Jill Yersak is Vice President of Mission Strategy. She joined the ALS Association in October of 2015. In her role, she supports coordination and integration of mission activity expands care services, research, and advocacy. She leads mission programs, including the ALS Roundtable Program and the ALS Focus Survey Program. Dr. Yersak is also responsible for communicating ALS research in an accessible way, by developing and giving research presentations tailored to people living with ALS, caregivers, and loved ones. She provides ALS association-wide support at the national level and throughout the chapter network and in all departments with research information needs. Dr. Yersak received her bachelor's degree in biology from Air Sinus College in Collegeville, Pennsylvania, her PhD in molecular biology from Thomas Jefferson University in Philly, and with a focus in neurodegenerative diseases. She completed her postdoctoral fellowship in neuroscience at Brown University, where she focused on ALS research. Dr. Jincy Andrews is an associate professor of neurology in the Division of Neuromuscular Medicine, and she serves as the director of neuromuscular clinical trials. She currently oversees neuromuscular clinical trials and cares for patients with neuromuscular disease, primarily ALS. Dr. Andrews has extensive experience in all phases of human clinical trials and drug development, in both academic and industry settings. Dr. Andrews is elected co-chair of the Northeastern ALS Consortium, also known as NEALS, which is a network of over 100 ALS clinical research centers internationally. She is also elected to the board, the National Board of Trustees for the ALS Association and is a fellow of the American Academy of Neurology. Dr. Andrews has also received the Diamond Award for ALS Clinical Research from Wings Over Wall Street and the MDA. Dr. Andrews received her Bachelor's of Science from Union College, her Master's of Science in Biostatistics, Patient-Oriented Research from Columbia's University Columbia University, excuse me, Mailman's School of Public Health, and her medical degree from Albany Medical College. She completed her residency training in neurology at the University of Connecticut and served as the chief neurolo neurology resident in her final years. Dr. Andrews completed fellowship training in neuromuscular disease, ALS, and clinical neurophysiology at Columbia University. She is a board certified uh, neurologist. She's also board certified in neuromuscular disease and electrodiagnostic medicine. And last but certainly not least, Dr. Dale Lang. Dr. Lang is a fellow of the American Academy of Neurology, a fellow of the American Neurological Association, neurologist in chief and chair of the Marcia Dunn and Jonathan Sobel Department of Neurology at Hospital for Special Surgery. He is also professor of neurology at Weill Cornell Medicine at Cornell University. Dr. Lang has devoted his career toward finding new ways to diagnose and treat patients with ALS and other neuromuscular diseases. He is the director of the ALS Association Certified Treatment Center of Excellence at the Hospital for Special Surgery. Dr. Lang has more than 30 years of experience leading and designing clinical trials in ALS and other neuromuscular diseases. HSS currently has 15 interventional clinical trials, eight of those devoted, devoted to patients living with ALS. Dr. Lang is the author of more than 120 peer-reviewed publications and chapters related to ALS and other neuromuscular diseases. He was the senior author of an international study first demonstrated a pharmacologic intervention lowered cerebral spinal fluid SOD1 levels in patients with SOD1-mediated ALS. Dr. Lang received his medical degree from New York Medical College and completed his residency at Tufts New England Medical Center in Boston. He served as a fellow in EMG and neuromuscular 
Disease at the Neurological Institute at Columbia University, where he co-founded and served as the co-director of the Eleanor and Lou Gehrig ALS Center at Columbia University with Louis P. Rowland. He is board certified in neurology, neuromuscular medicine, and electrodiagnostic medicine. He is the former president of the New York Neurological Society. Our chapter is fortunate to have such a distinguished panel of experts to present to you this evening. Just a couple of housekeeping notes before we get started. Please type your questions into the chat area and we will get to all of your questions at the end of the segment. You can also enter your questions on the Whova app. We also ask that if you'd like to send your questions anonymously, you can just click on the send anonymously bu send anonymous button. Sarah Fitch is here with us. She works at the ALS Association Greater New York chapter with me, and she will be helping to uh, get your questions to the doctor so we can uh, get them answered. Without any further delay, I'd like to turn the mic over to Jill, Dr. Jill Yersek. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you so much for having me for the Great New York chapter. Um, I live outside of Philadelphia. I can get to New York in about an hour, and I'm very excited to get back to your area and to hopefully see everyone at the chapter um, when things get a little bit better in uh, with the COVID environment. But thank you for having me. Uh, we're all happy to be here today, and I'm going to start out our, our panel. So uh, next slide, please. So. Um, the ALS Association is the largest philanthropic funder in, of ALS funder in the world. We fund ALS research um, all over the globe, not just in the United States. And we're the only um, association or ALS organization that has all three pillars, which is research, care services, and advocacy. We've uh, committed over $100 million, $110 million since the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge, um, which we're really proud of, to research projects all over the world. And that covers not just uh, basic research, but infrastructure, training, and education. And one of the big, biggest things that we're proud of, and I think Cole was here with us, with our chief scientist was with you last night, is that all the research funding we do is really aimed at, at uh, leveraging a dollars for, for researchers. So that the grants they get from the ALS Association can get the data they need to, to go on to, even, to apply for bigger grants, such as at the National Institutes of Health. And this has been really successful over the years and we're something we're really proud of. Um, next slide. So as you can see, this is our um, research pipeline that we fund. Uh, we fund everything from um, what causes ALS, so very basic biological um, um, laboratory. Uh, we, look in, we look deeply at the cells and uh, motor neurons to understand what's the underlying cause of, it, of ALS. So when you think of someone in the lab looking in the microscope, that's what we were funding. We also then fund, once you get out of the lab and have a, a, a drug target, um, we, we fund drug development and biomarkers. Um, and I'll get, give a little bit more information about biomarkers. And then um, we also fund phase one and phase two trials. We don't fund phase three trials. It's just um, too expensive. But along the way, we fund, we fund the infrastructure, uh, data storage, and data sharing. Uh, the association, we're really proud and um, emphasize um, that we that data that we um, fund is open and shared with the entire ALS community so everyone can benefit. And also tools and the training. So we have, um, we fund a lot of postdoctoral fellows. Uh, the Greater New York Chapter um, has the Milton St. Benowitz um, postdoctoral fellowship program with the St. Benowitz family. We've been working with for years. It's been a wonderful partnership and have been funding postdoctoral fellows who are scientists who finished their PhDs um, on our, our picked ALX uh, to study um, for their careers. And um, um, over 70%, I think almost 80% of our fellows have gone on to start their own ALS labs and those who haven't um, are still in the ALS space and um, like myself. And, uh, like in a nonprofit. Um, so like, again, we fund a ton of projects all over the world right now, just to give everyone likes numbers. So I'll give you some numbers, but we fund uh, um, over 175 active projects in 15 countries and with a current commitment of over $58 million. So this is something we're really proud of. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm gonna be focusing mostly on the clinical trials um, today, but I wanted just to start out with the drug development and just hit a few points home that it's a really complex process. It, it could take years. This, these are just estimates. It's, these are rough estimates, but it could, you can see it takes 
at least 10 years and a lot of hard work to get from uh, a bunch of compounds when you're screening compounds to see what could be a potential target all the way to the one compound that is hopefully approved by the FDA. Next slide. And the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services report in 2014, and I know that's um, dated, but I think this is pretty much the same. It's, a, it's estimated about, it takes at least 161 million to over 2 billion to bring a new drug to market. Um, so this is um, something, again, takes time and it can be very, is very expensive. Uh, next slide. So now I'm just, I'm going to start us off in this uh, large panel around um, giving you really some background of what, what clinical trials are and how the pipeline works. And then Jinsey's going to go into more about what's happening in the United States and how COVID's impacted um, cl clinical trials. And then Dr. Lang is going to talk about uh, what's happening here in New York. So I'll start out with just giving some basic information. And that's And I always like to start with, you know, what are the types of trials. So when you think of a clinical trial, you, most people think of an interventional trial, meaning it tests a potential therapy where a participant is either assigned to a placebo or the drug, and it's really used to determine whether a therapy is working or not. Well, on the other side of the coin, which a lot of people don't think about when they think about a trial, is an observational trial, where enrolled participants are really observed over time. That's why they call it observational. No treatment's given here, but it's usually used to learn about trends in disease progression, how someone's uh, progressing over time, or to potential uh, test a potential biomarker. And this is a really great way to get involved in uh, research studies if you're not eligible to um, take part in interventional trials. I'm not into get I'm not going to get into eligibility requirements um, in particular today, but um, a lot of interventional trials have a much more stringent um, criteria in order to be enrolled. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, there you go. Thank you. So um, what I mean by a bar biomarker is really any measurable substance that changes in quantity or appears or disappears in, um, in your body. And so when you think about it, it could be a chemical change in your blood, your urine, um, your cerebral spinal fluid, and that's the fluid that really protects your brain and, and your spinal cord. It can even be a structural or chemical change in your brain itself, or it could be um, a change in um, muscle uh, strength. If there's a bunch of different biomarkers that you can think of. And they're so important, and um, especially the clinical trials, because it can really help understand whether uh, a clinical trial is hitting its target or not. Is it hitting the, is it actually getting into the brain? Is it going into, is it hitting the motor neurons? Is it affecting the motor neurons? Are levels of the, the protein that they're looking at or trying to, to get rid of, is that, actually, is, that, is that protein actually going away with the drug? So there's ways to measure with a biomarker whether these trials are working or not. But it's also um, really important to improve diagnos diagnosis and follow progression over time. I'm not going to get much into that, but with the diagnosis piece, it's so important because diagnosis for ALS patients is around a year and we can do so much better. And having a biomarker to understand um, if you have a disease or earlier, even earlier, it's going to be a huge game changer in the ALS space. And a lot of researchers all over the world that we fund and um, others um, are really working hard to, to move forward to those um, both diagnostic and clinical trial biomarkers. Um, so next slide, please. Like I said, I'm going to give you a brief overview of how what the clinical trial pipeline works um, and how the FDA regulatory process works. Next slide. So phase one is the first phase, obviously. Um, it rolls the small number of participants. And these participants could either be someone with ALS or either even healthy volunteers. And um, the main goal of this is just to really understand what's the optimal safe dose or the maximum tolerated dose, how much can you give a person to make sure it's, it's still safe? Is it tolerated in your body? Does it have a lot of adverse effects or not? And how does the actual drug behave in the body? And that's called pharmacokinetics. And um, th so this is just the smallest part and the most, you know, but also very important. A lot of um, trials um, um, can fail at this point if it's, if it's not safe and then they have to go back to the drawing board. Next slide, please. 
So phase two is really the go, no go decision point for, for drug companies. They typically roll 30 to 50 participants. It's, it's smaller, um, maybe even less, depending on what the type of drug is. It, it's designed to get more safety information um, and still testing a range of doses to get the, the best dose possible. Uh, if you're always still trying to look at if, it's the, if the drug's tolerated, and then um, it's the first time they're really looking more at um, efficacy. What does it mean? What does that mean? It's is whether a drug is hitting its target and is doing what it's designed to do. And so um, this is something that again, this is a go go no go phase. Um, and if this uh, fails, then we go back to the drawing board again. Next next slide. The phase three is really, I like to call the confirmatory phase. It's the largest number of participants. Again, the numbers depend on the type of drug in the trial, but it's, it's at multiple centers in the United States and sometimes abroad. And it really is designed to understand definitive drug efficacy and tolerability and really gives, is designed to have power and within most amount of people to convince the FDA with evidence to, to support approval of the drug. Is it hitting all its targets? Is it doing what it's supposed to do? Is it having an effect on a person's function, survival, and other um, clinical trial endpoints that people look at, that scientists look at? So um, once uh, a study is, um, once you're, when a person is done their, their trial arm or their um, experimental arm, some, some tr clinical trial um, companies decide to open an open label extension study. So what that means are participants who are originally randomized to a drug or a placebo are, can choose to continue on a, an active drug. So if you're on a placebo, you go on an active drug. If you're on an active drug, you continue, can continue on an active drug. And you're on an active drug until they, the company decides um, whether the, the drug um, gets to get the data back and they understand whether if, if, if there's efficacy or not. Um, I think, oh, then the other thing I want to say is that there's a lot of misconceptions around um, all the trials and whether you're uh, what what you're assigned to and when you're when you get that information and whether you're in placebo or an experimental arm they always give you that information so don't believe people who say they that um, you don't get that information they just have, the companies just have to wait and hold that information until the last person is dosed in this trial and then they'll open it up and let you know which um, which um, which arm you're in so so it's, um, so the companies that we work with, and I, I've, um, Jimsy and uh, Dr. Lang have dealt with, are really um, thoughtful around how they can best give that, give that information to participants who are um, kind enough to, and brave enough um, to participate in clinical trials. Next slide. So once your phase three trial is done, the, a lot of it, a lot of work happens at the company level to submit a, a new drug application or NDA, and it's a huge document, hundreds and hundreds of patient pages. It's all the results from all the trials, even the preclinical data, the data in in, um, in animals that supported um, for the company to go into clinical trials, and it also includes proposed labeling and how it's going to be manufactured. So it's a lot of work. It takes a few months um, or more to get this ready. Um, and then the, they submit to the FDA. The FDA then either approves a drug or requests additional studies. Um, and if the drug is approved, um, it's, it's then goes to formulation scale up, meaning they try to get as many uh, drugs ready for, for distribution and manufacturer gets, manufacturing gets on the way, in the way, on, on the way, can't talk today. So if I, well, the other really important point I want to make is if, if the drug does fail, it's it's not great. We've seen a lot of that happen a lot in the ALS space, unfortunately, but it's not all is lost. I want to emphasize that. It still provides um, science and researchers and doctors really critical information about the trial and, what, and then usually informs how you can do better next time and how we can improve to get a trial to actually work. And, we, and I just want to mention the ALS Association has worked um, a lot with the FDA. We have a strong relationship with the FDA in that we have been working with them for years to create um, the ALS Drug Development Guidance for Industry, which is really a ro roadmap to help companies understand what the FDA expects of them in order to have an approved drug. And we worked um, together with um, patients with the ALS and, their, and caregivers and industry partners and scientists and academics and doctors all over the world 
to inform this process. And um, it's something that, you know, we came up with a really large 100 page document and the FDA codes back and this is normal with a, a, a much shorter document. Um, but when you have a guidance, always remember that it's not always set, it's not set in stone forever. It's just something that can change and be updated over time. Uh, next slide, please. So once the drug is approved, and that's what we're aiming for, of course, um, we the company make, wants to make sure, and uh, the, the association and scientists want to make sure there's no other safety concerns that come up or other issues. So they gather real world evidence in uh, in people who are taking the drug over time. And it could help reveal potentials of how it can the drug will interact with other drugs in the space. Um, it could maybe have different formulations or even have indications that other diseases and be repurposed maybe for another neurodegenerative disease, for example. Um, and this is something we um, we are we hope to fund also at from the ALS Association this, these post marketing trials. Uh, next slide, please. So Jinzy and uh, Dale are going to give a lot of information around the clinical trial, trial landscape, but I just want to give a quick overview. There's currently over 100 clinical trials, if you count both interventional and observational. Um, uh, over seven are in phase three. And again, we fund um, up to phase two trials, and we cannot fund phase three because of the, the cost of the trials. We, we funded phase three trials. We wouldn't have anyone left over to fund really much else. Next slide, please. So I always like to end with this. This is so important. Uh, and this is a question I get, I'm sure everyone on this panel has gotten this, how to search for clinical trials in your area. And we have a really long lasting um, partnership with the Northeast ALS Consortium or NEALS, uh, which Jinzi is a, a co-chair of. Um, and they have a really great website and search engine for um, searching for clinical trials in your area. Um, so, I, so please go to this website um, that I put up here for you. And what I like to do is do an advanced search if you don't know have a specific keyword and I'll click interventional trial like I taught you tonight, which is really testing a drug. If that's what you're interested in, then you can click down to location and what state you're in. So if I live in New Jersey, I'm gonna click New Jersey, an interventional trial, and then I wanna see what's enrolling in my area. So you click enrolling and that'll spit out a list of clinical trials that are in your area. So that will give you um, some information you can take to your doctor and ask him for, for information for whether you're eligible and how you can participate if you're interested. If you're interested, and then I also always like to mention Carly Allen. She's um, our concierge of uh, clinical trials. She's she's fabulous. Um, she's um, here. At, you can email her, call her at this number to um, ask any question about uh, clinical trials, and she is she she no questions, silly just. Please give her a call, email her, and she'll get back to you uh, right away with um, answers to your questions about round trials. Because the goal is to get people enrolled and to understand and not be not be afraid to do so. So um, with that, I'd like to thank everyone for having me again. Thank you, Tracy, Jillian, and Sarah, and Kristen, um, and T for having me. And I would like to pass it over to Dr. Jinzi Andrews. Thanks, Jinzi. Thank you, Dr. Yersak. Um, and that was a nice segue to lay in the foundation for clinical trials and what we expect um, in terms of phases of clinical trials and also the um, clinical trials navigator. Aleka was a great resource for people if you have questions about which clinical trials are running in your area. Carly Allen at, at Meals um, is able to provide that concierge type service to help you locate a trial or a, a physician conducting a trial. So now, um, based on the foundation that you've got, uh, I'll now kind of give a clinical trials update of what's going on in the landscape uh, and kind of walk you through some of the developments that have already occurred, what, is, what we're anticipating to hear about, and then um, also talk about how COVID has impacted some of our clinical trial operations. So if we can go to the next slide, I think um, what I wanted to talk about first is a couple of recent publications that came out in the New England Journal of Medicine in the second half of 2020. Most of us are aware of uh, gene therapy targeting a specific form of ALS associated with SOD1. Um, and that gene therapy is called an antisense oligonucleotide, which is uh, being developed by Biogen, and it's called Topherson. Originally, it only had numbers, which was BIIB067. Um, and if you go to the next slide, 
an early phase one uh, and phase two interim analysis. So this is when uh, Jill was talking earlier about phase one and phase two, we were really looking for the how the drug is concentrated and, and how it is um, metabolized in the, in the human body. And does it have effects on abnormal proteins that are associated with the SOD1 form of ALS? Those were the questions. So we were looking at pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of that drug. And this actually I pulled from the poster because it's a little bit more clear that was presented of the interim analysis where they studied different doses of tofersin in SOD1 ALS patients. And in those uh, doses that ranged anywhere from 20 milligrams as the lowest dose to 100 milligrams at the highest dose, you had significant lowering of the abnormal SOD1 protein concentrations in the spinal fluid of patients with ALS. Along with that, we were able to see some clinical changes uh, across the study. And so again, this was a small study studying a small number of patients in each of the doses, and it was really to study what would be the optimal dose it, to carry forward, and also to study how a drug behaves in the body, and if there was any chance that we could see any preliminary signal of effect. And in the highest doses uh, at 100 milligram, which was in only 10 patients, we were able to see that the ALS FRS score, the overall function, that decline was slower in the highest dose of tofersin. This was also correlated with other clinical measures of breathing and muscle. And uh, what I can say is that this provided the foundation to carry tofersin into a pivotal study, which many of you may be familiar with already. It's called Valor, and it's currently enrolled fully, and we're waiting for the last patient to finish their last visit to read out um, a final results for that clinical trial. So it is considered what we call a pivotal trial or a last phase three trial. Um, and uh, I know that Biogen has publicly announced that they should have results in the second half of 2021. And they have also publicly announced that they will try to launch an early access program uh, later this year for patients specifically with fast progressing disease that carry the SOD1 mutation. And if you go to the next slide, the other highlight from 2020 was the study of AMX0035, which is a combination of sodium phenylbutyrate and terursodiol, or TUDCA, um, some people refer to, um, was also published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And this was developed by a company called Amelix. And again, in a placebo-controlled study, if you can go to the next slide, um, this this study evaluated 137 patients, and it, it, it was a two-to-one randomization. So people were more likely to be randomly selected to receive treatment compared to placebo. And so in this study, there was the pre-specified endpoint was to look at the rate of decline of function over time, over six months, uh, in between the treatment and the placebo arm. So to compare the rate of decline. And in this study, there was a slowing of that rate of decline, or what we call the slope of decline of uh, the ALS functional rating scale of about 0.42 points per month, which was statistically significant. And in the treatment arm, there were fewer adverse events and also fewer SAEs than in the placebo, I'm sorry, than in the treatment arm. So the treatment arm, if I got that right, had less AEs and less SAEs than the placebo arm. Um, and if there was any adverse events, they were uh, mainly GI. And in an open label extension, there was um, a survival benefit of about 44% reduction of the risk of death. Uh, when you looked at people who were originally on uh, AMX0035 and then continued on for the next six months compared to those who were initially on placebo and then switched over later uh, in the open label extension to AMX0035. And so based on that information and really uh, hitting their pre-specified endpoint, um, they were able to um, look at that data and try to provide it to regulatory, uh, regulatory authorities for review. And if you can go to the next slide, um, what I will mention is that the study that was completed was also funded um, partly by the ALS Association. And so this study, uh, there was a press release um, released on March 9th, um, so just last month, 
that the authorities, the regulatory authorities in Canada have invited a submission for review to see if they could possibly allow uh, some access to the, um, to the investigational drug, um, including a special access program. This data, clinical trial data, is also actively under review uh, with the European authorities and also with the FDA. So it's anticipated that we should hear more information in the upcoming um, weeks. And so we, we anxiously await that. Other news, if you go to the next slide, there are um, a couple of things that I did want to highlight. These are these have been completed, but I just wanted to make sure that everybody was on the same page about the trial results. So um, Orion had a drug called levosomendin that was the skeletal muscle activator, and that completed in the summer of 2020, and the study results were negative on the endpoint of breathing uh, compared between treatment arm and placebo arm. And then uh, more popular discussions have been in the patient community about Brainstorm, which completed a US-based phase three study of neuron, which is autologous stem cells. And their primary endpoint was um, a little bit different than our typical endpoints. It was looking at a responder analysis, but they did not see a statistically significant difference between the treated arm and the placebo arm. And their pre-specified primary and secondary endpoints did not hit uh, statistical significance, um, and the FDA did release a, a comment about their perspectives on their review that's publicly available. Um, additionally, there is another uh, clinical trial that uh, is completing, which is from Orphazon on a drug called Aramacomol. We are anticipating that the phase three clinical trial results should come out in the first half of 2021, so we're eagerly awaiting the results of that clinical trial as well. If you go to the next slide, um, I just highlighted a whole bunch of clinical trial updates and readouts that are, are here and also we're anticipating and reactions from regulatory authorities, but we still have a pretty robust pipeline. Um, Jill had put the pipeline up and highlighted several drugs. Many of these, including the platform trial, which is also funded heavily by the ALS Association, are currently enrolling. And you can see the pipeline kind of tilts a little bit towards um, earlier phase clinical trials. And uh, Dr. Lang will talk a little bit more about what's available in the New York area. Um, but I starred the ones that are actively enrolling. And if you can go to the next slide, um, in addition to the drugs that are listed in phase one, two, and three, there's, a, of course, heavy interest in stem cell and cell-based therapies. These are much earlier in clinical development. So we really are still trying to understand how best to give stem cells, what type of stem cells would be the best. Um, and if we give them, how, how do we give them? Do we put them in the spinal fluid? We, do we put them in the spinal cord? Um, so those approaches are still early in development. Additionally, there's been a heavy interest in T regulatory cell therapy, and there are different ways to even give that. There's, there's um, an understanding that the immune system is not quite functioning properly in ALS, and that relates to T regulatory cell function. And there are two different approaches. One is to try to take your own T regulatory cells, teach them how to behave properly and put them back in, or trying to get other people's T regulatory cells, we call it allogenic T cells versus autologous, which is your own cells. And so these are all in early phase one um, or phase two type studies uh, and that are ongoing. Um, additionally, I will highlight some of the gene-directed therapies. I told you a little bit about tofersin, but right on the heels of tofersin, Biogen is developing a compound targeting the C9 gene, and it's currently enrolled and ongoing. It's much earlier. It's in phase one, so we're still trying to understand what is the optimal dose to carry forward in a larger clinical trial. There are actually a few other companies that will be entering into the ALS space to look at C9. So uh, when I speak to people uh, that are newly diagnosed, I talk about genetic testing and why it's important. Um, so for SOD, it's important to screen because there may be an early access program available for people who are progressing quickly um, by Biogen later this year. And there are other C9 investigational drugs that are upcoming. So it's important to be screened and to have that knowledge uh, ahead of time. Um, Biogen is also developing an ataxin 2 antisense oligonucleotide and uh, Ionis Pharmaceuticals has um, partnered with Columbia to develop um, an antisense oligonucleotide targeting 
the FUS mutation, FUS, which is um, a very rare mutation, less common than SOD and C9. If you go to the next slide, um, I just wanted to highlight one of the um, uh, clinical trials that uh, kind of incorporate innovative elements. And so I think it's been pretty clear that people living with the disease don't want to be on uh, very long 12-month, 18-month placebo-controlled trials and trying to be mindful of try, uh, being efficient of people's times that when they volunteer their time into a clinical trial. And because the pipeline had so many early phase compounds that need to be tested, if you test them sequentially, it would take a lot of time to start and stop each trial to understand whether we should take it forward for a confirmatory trial. So the platform trial is an infrastructure. It's not necessarily a particular drug. It's an infrastructure that allows sites in the US. So it's a US-based infrastructure, although there are European versions of the platform trial for motor neuron disease that are being launched simultaneously. In the US, um, there is a platform trial that is actually actively enrolling uh, participants. And in this trial, we are able to select drugs through an independent selection review committee. Those drugs are then entered into the platform trial and they can enter at any given time. So once the infrastructure is in place, you can um, enter any drug. So in this scenario that's in front of us, there's a drug A, drug B and drug C. You can see that drug A and B enter at the same time. And then if drug C looks promising and we need to understand whether that is a, a drug that has a potential uh, and good rationale to be studied in ALS, we can enter it in there. And one of the uh, unique things about it is as a person journeys through, so when you enter in, you'll sign an informed consent, after which you'll be randomly assigned to one of the available drugs in the platform, drug A, B, or C. After you've been randomly selected to a specific drug, you'll then be randomized again, either to placebo or to active. And there's a three to one randomization. So there's uh, it favors treatment over placebo. Once you complete your 24 weeks, if you can click on the next uh, graphic, a person then has the option to enroll in what's called the open label extension. Now, Jill explained earlier, open label extension, it's where, it's where you are, you know you're getting drug, your physician knows you're getting drug, and the sponsor knows you're getting drug. And it's essentially um, uh, first given to people who complete or have given generously their time to the primary main study. Now, at the end of that study, you can choose to roll over, or if you click on the next um, uh, graphic, what you'll see is that you can choose to go on the open label extension, or if you wanted to see if you uh, were, if you had an interest in trying some of the other drugs and you are still eligible, you can re-randomize in the clinical trial and be assigned a different drug, say drug B or C instead. And so this gives uh, a participant more chances of being on treatment versus placebo. It then gives first access to those patients to the experimental therapy, or it gives them a choice to re-randomize should they continue to be eligible for the uh, master protocol. And so if you go to the next slide, why we're doing it this way really comes from this uh, graphic on the slide, which is essentially explaining the potential efficacy of using the platform trial to look for efficacy in a drug. So traditional drug development programs, if you assume, um, if you if you assume it takes 10% of therapies that are tested that would be effective in slowing the disease rate by 30%, you would take about 12 years and you would need to test at least 10 treatments and test it in 2,400 participants, half of which would need to be on placebo. But in this adaptive platform trial design, it would reduce the time it would take to four years in this scenario. You would still test 10 treatments, but you would only need 1,600 participants and only 400 of which would be exposed to placebo. And so uh, again, given, given that even after the trial participation, all of the participants, despite being on placebo treatment, will be rolled over and get access to experimental therapy. Um, and so hopefully this explains some of the creativeness, uh, creativity actually, that's involved in the trial design for the platform trial. If you go to the next slide, I think it, uh, I just wanted to highlight what the few drugs in the platform trial are. So the first one is the leukoplan. This is a complement uh, inhibitor. So complement is an aspect of the immune system that we think is not functioning properly and causing uh, neuroinflammation and motor, neuro, motor neuron death. 
Verdiprostat is a myeloperoxidase inhibitor, and it's something that inhibits the macrophages from attacking in the neuroinflammatory process and the motor nerves. And then there's gold nanocrystals that is thought to um, help with the bioenergetics of the cell and reduce oxidative stress. And then the fourth regimen, regimen D, has been selected to be predopidine, and this is a sigma-1 receptor um, agonist. If we go to the next slide, um, I wanted to talk a little bit, uh, Dr. Lang's going to talk a little bit more about some of the trials and some of the medications available in our area, but I just wanted to touch base really quick. I get asked commonly about the impact of COVID and, and did it really uh, throw a wrench in all of our plans for testing investigational therapies and getting closer to a meaningful treatment. And so uh, we learned a lot and it was by no means an easy task um, to continue clinical trials, but uh, for most of our centers across the United States, we were able to continue and actually talk with each other to help each other continue very important clinical trials, and especially for, for people who were in the middle of their trials to make sure they weren't discontinued. And so if you go to the next slide, I think one of the lessons, uh, one of the lessons we learned is really to how to quickly adjust uh, clinical trial protocols. It was helpful that the FDA did provide guidance and some rules of flexibility to conducting clinical trials in the COVID period or the COVID era, um, but we really had to shift very quickly. And so we incorporated virtual visits when in-person visits was not possible um, and really had to be judicious about when we brought patients in and we had to understand how to mitigate risks for the staff conducting the clinical trial visits, but also for people and participants who were in the clinical trials, how to mitigate risks to them uh, for COVID. We um, tried to figure out how to use home-based companies to collect local um, uh, safety labs or EKGs or even vitals for safety monitoring for clinical trials. Um, shipping drugs and trying to figure out how to do drug accountability. This is an important aspect of clinical trials that um, we heavily get inspected and audited for. Um, and drug accountability is an important aspect of it. So trying to get drug to people when they can't come to the site is, is tricky. Sounds easy, but it is tricky. Um, but we, we managed actually through the, through the whole surge uh, last year. And then uh, it really led the field to think about remote collection of outcome measures using home accelerometers, home spirometry, dynamometry, grip measure strength, you name it, uh, people are looking at it. And then of course, using telephone and telemedicine visits really made us think about, do we need to bring people that often to the center? And, and if we do, it should be for critical data points that are meaningful to the study. And, and, and I think it really helped us reduce the burden of clinical trial visits for, for people living with the disease and their caregivers and their family. And if you can go to the next slide, one of the things um, that we have been looking at is trying to assess breathing. Breathing was one of those endpoints that are commonly used as a secondary endpoint. Um, and in many of the studies, we were able to continue, but one of the limitations, it was almost, I think, 75 to 80% of the centers during the peak surge of COVID could not perform a vital capacity. And we use vital capacity to make clinical decisions about whether people need respiratory equipment, whether they, uh, whether it's time to refer for a feeding tube placement or uh, to provide prognosis when people ask where they are in their disease. And so this was a really rate limiting step for uh, a lot of issues. Um, and so uh, Dr. Schaffner over at Barrow Neurologic is looking at sustained phonation over time. A lot of other centers have been using sustained phonation. This is where your provider might say, okay, I want you to take a deep breath and say, ah, for as long as you can, ah, and you measure in seconds and trying to correlate it with our commonly used measure like forced vital capacity and see if we can do something simple that could give us a lot of meaningful information. Um, so that's one good thing that's come out of um, some of our hurdles based in clinical trials and clinics. And if you can go to the next slide, another, another thing that we've approached is looking at investigational compounds and seeing if there's anything that's low hanging fruit, that's easy to take, that's very, very safe, even by FDA standards. So Theracurmin is essentially a formulation of turmeric. And um, Dr. Bedlack over at Duke has been following ALS reversals. And, and so in his search of these reversals, he noticed that several of these, about six out of the 48, had been taking Theracurmin. And in the era of COVID, understanding that we can collect some things from home 
um, and still judge whether something should be uh, carried forward and further investigated. He's piloting a completely remote clinical trial where you collect uh, some of the data and some of the safety information remotely and in, in the context of testing something that is very, very safe, even by FDA standards and could be given as such. So um, I think we've learned a lot uh, in trying to overcome some of our hurdles um, with COVID coming in uh, to our lives last year. And if you can go to the next slide. Um, I think uh, what I'll do now is just turn it over to Dr. Lang to kind of take us through what the landscape looks like in ALS and in the greater New York region. So at this time, I'd like to uh, hand it over to Dr. Lang, if um, possible, to kind of take us through some of the clinical trials that are running in our greater New York area. Dr. Lang? Thanks, Gen Z. I want to give, uh, thank the uh, ALS Association of Greater New York to, uh, for their opportunity to speak uh, tonight and to tell you about some of the exciting things that are, that are happening um, uh, here. Um, I'm not sure if my video is not on, is it? Yes, it is. The video is on. You're good. Yes, it. Great. Um, I, I just want to second Jinzi's commentary about our, our creativity that that we had to use and the FDA's uh, uh, willingness to to work with us and the companies willing to work with with us uh, during COVID. Uh, it, it was a Herculean effort to try to get the patients who are already in, enrolled and and get meaningful data with all of the effort that it takes to be part of the study. And I really want to thank everybody that was part of this uh, of all of our studies and all the institutions for the uh, determination and the willingness to, to, to uh, and, and the flexibility to work with us as we rediscovered ourselves. <laughs> um, I wanna talk a little bit today, today about what's happening in the New York area. We, we are fortunate because we have so many really good centers uh, that are, are work very hard and dedicated to uh, to caring for for patients with ALS and trying to working and trying to, to come up with uh, new ideas for treatment and and participating both in the phase one trials as well as phase two and and three when available. So I, what I want to start out with is just a list of some of the trials that are going on, mostly interventional trials. I focused on. So, um, and, and I'll, I'll focus uh, a little bit about each of the individual trials as to what I, I think you should focus on when you're thinking about a trial. But this just sort of summarizes the different phases of, of um, the different trials that, that we're, we're, we're all engaged with. So at HSS, we've got um, uh, four actively enrolled, enrolling trials or, or, and, or ready to enroll, which we mean by that is contracts are done and we're ready to, to um, go through the final stages of organization and, 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 uh, and recruitment. Um, and and uh, uh, we also like to do phase one trials, which are really um, somewhat creative and, 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 and developing novel therapies. So one of our trials is actually using uh, uh, ref, um, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation to see if we can impact the um, cognitive function and spasticity. Startup phases are really we we've been we, we're starting to enter into contractual um, uh, negotiations. Um, the hospital has to to make sure that they're protected and the companies are protected and the, and the, and the participants are protected. So that lasts uh, sometimes three two three months to, to in negotiations. Um, so we have uh, both uh, Columbia and ourselves are in, involved in, in one of the trials in cytokinetics uh, phase three, a uh, rather deceptive uh, trial, and then we're also involved in, in, in an exon uh, trial. Completed trials can be of one of two types, and Jinzi uh, referred uh, to those a, a little bit. Now, those that are not enrolling anymore, we've reached our target uh, number, but, but the trial is still ongoing. Uh, that can be applied to uh, uh, in, in our group the the Alexion trial as well as uh, we we were the first uh, in a multi small multi center trial to, to look at PLS uh, using an effective drug that's been known for in ALS community and that's dalfampridine and then uh, and as Jinzi said there, there's there's closed data for orfazime and and we're we're hoping that uh, 
uh, some results will be uh, uh, re revealed uh, hopefully in, in quarter two or three. Um, Jinzi shared with, Dr. Andrew shared with me a, a little bit of the trials they're undergoing now. And they're, as she mentioned, platform trials are currently enrolling and there's a couple in startup phases. Um, and then also completed, but uh, but not, uh, com they're, they're completed but, and not enrolling, but still uh, patients engaged in the Biogen trials. Uh, Mount Sinai uh, is in the startup phase for the a new uh, um, uh trial. So you, there's really a host of different options for for patients who are so um, inclined to be participating in our clinical research trials. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Next slide. Sorry, am I still connected? <laughs> yes, you are. Can you go to the this next is the, This is the next slide. Oh, I'm sorry, we got you. Um, so what I, wanted, what I wanted to do uh, to, today is to, before we get started, was to just go over some of the general principles I tried to talk to people about um, in, um, in when they're thinking about joining us with, with our work in, um, in our clinical trials. Um, First of all, the, the, it's really important to understand that this isn't a treatment, it's an experiment, and we're working on this together. And so um, everybody wants to get into a trial to help themselves, but really we're, we're, the general concept is to, for us to learn uh, and, and, to, and to, to contribute to the field. And, and then trying to understand what phase is best for you uh, in the personality and, and lifestyle. Um, phase one, you know, you generally get the drug, even in phase two A's you do. Uh, but phase two and three are really where we really make a difference in, in, in pivotal style trials. There is a schedule of activities in every trial that tells you how many times you have to come in, how that fits into your life and daily activities. You really should look at that and ask the investigators and the investigator team to, to review that with you. Uh, the frequent every week activities may not be bad for someone who lives within the neighborhood, um, but... Um, but, uh, but if you have to travel several, travel several hours, that's hard. Um, double blind trials, I try to make sure that everybody understands that this is not Russian roulette. It, it is it being randomized placebo is really not a bad, a, a bad um, problem. Uh, it, it, there is a defined endpoint for everybody and that being involved in a trial, if there is a clear signal that the drug is working, you will benefit from that and, and it will be revealed that those endpoints are present at the beginning of the, of the um, uh, of, of are defined at the beginning of the trial. What's the ratio is important. Some placebo control trials are one to one, others are two to one. And if there is a placebo component that we talked about earlier, is there an open label for, uh, extension? And I think that that's important for most of the the, the participants uh, in trials to to know that if they give us a year of of a study, that that most uh, sponsors will help. Um, uh, and contribute to the uh, to, to 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 being able to to give them drug to give people drug at at the at the conclusion of the study. Um, next slide. All the, most of the trials uh, in at present in the uh, in in the New York area uh, are, are really focused now in trying to modulate the inflammatory response, and and it the, the, then and this uh, graph shows. That in some aspects, uh, that that the red circles are showing that there is a that that represents people that have a very active pro-inflammatory response, and Dr. Appel's work has shown that people that sit in in that group that have that very active um, uh, um, pro-inflammatory response uh, seem to progress uh, uh, fairly rapidly, and those people that have pro-inflammatory activation uh, uh, will will go. Will, will may move faster, and people who have protective inflammation will be slower. And he's got some very nice uh, studies showing that at least in some people, the more you maintain your your protective inflammation, the slower the course will be. Uh, next slide. And one of the components of that is uh, shown on the right is uh, under the, the this is an, uh, an animal model of the TD4043 model that shows that that um, 
uh, as the disease progresses in this model, the blue bar represents a form of, uh, of an inflammatory response that shows that, that the proteins that are being upregulated in these animals are significantly in, uh, in, uh, increased in, in activating complement. So complement is, is one of the factors of inflammation that the body has to protect itself. And it, and, and it seems that, or, uh, that the more complement you make, it may be correlated with the, with the greater degree of neural dysfunction. Uh, next slide, please. So, just in terms of some of the uh, some of the actual trials that are going on, the, uh, these are some of the questions that I tried to, to outline that you might want to ask and focus on as you're thinking about uh, trials. What phases it is? Is it is it in? Is it an open label? Not. What's the primary endpoint? Um, uh, you should at least be able to understand why we're doing it and what where, where we're going with the trials. What's the mechanism of action should be explained to you in, a, in, a, in at least an understandable way. And, and what's the basis of the action? And, and then for sure, how do you get in? Do you meet the criteria? And that's part of the screening process. And then how is it given? Is it either given by subcutaneous math, uh, maneuvers? Is it given by an oral uh, medication? Or is it, is it given um, by IV? In this instance, this is a phase 2A trial. It's open label. People are getting different doses. They're trying to figure out which dose is effective. This is an antibody to a component of the immune system that is thought to be activated. And, it, and, and the antibody controls that pro-inflammation and may in, in, involve activating the pathways that may lead to more aggressive disease. So that's, that's the hypothesis. Um, the, 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 there are some uh, entry uh, criteria, and this is an infusion product. Uh, next slide. Um, so there, another again uh, agent that acts on the infusions uh, on the immune system is ibutalast. Uh, this has been around for quite a long time. This is now in a, in a, a close to a phase three trial. Uh, and it, 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 it's a, a very long trial, but it's, but, but um, it is, it is de defined, it is designed so that it will, it will answer the question as to whether or not prolonged inhibition of the pro-inflammatory cytokines that, that, that we think uh, uh, for, converts the disease into a more aggressive disorder is mitigated uh, by, by drugs that interfere with this immune response. This is an oral medication. And again, its primary endpoint is, a, is a, a change in the ALS functional rating scale. Next, next slide, please. Um, this is a, 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 a drug uh, that we're trying, um, we're, we're enrolling now using, um, uh, it's Pegacetacoplan, uh, made by the company called Pellis. It's a C3 complement inhibitor. Again, a drug that's designed to interfere with the uh, pro-inflammatory response that we think the body is making in it, the immune, immune activation uh, linked to ALS progression. Uh, animal, animal models do show that there is a correlation with progression and that people with ALS do have high levels of complement suggesting an activation. This is a subcutaneous injection, so that, that's helpful in terms of being able to, to um, not have to come necessarily for long periods into the, into the hospital for, uh, for um, it, uh, receiving the drug. Next slide, please. Um, this is, a, this is a, a, a proof of biology study that's actually, if, you're, if patients are, are intrigued in, in our science, this is about as heavy a science as you can get. Um, the, an exon is trying to determine whether or not inhibition of, the, of, of one form of complement uh, is, is, can produce a change in some of the biomarkers that we talked about earlier. So it's really a very, very intricate in terms of being able to identify scientific endpoints. Um, they're trying to look at some of the, the pro-inflammatory um, uh, products that, um, that are, are present pre-treatment and post-treatment in the spinal fluid, as well as uh, in the serum. And, and actually, the, the first infusion requires a, 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 a stay of, a, of almost 24 hours, so it's going to be challenging for, for both patients and, and uh, investigators, but its, it's uh, end point will be unique and uh, will, will certainly yield very important um, 
scientific data. Um, next slide, please. And th this is a trial that I think uh, Columbia and us uh, are, are, will be uh, starting soon. Uh, and it's again, uh, looking to try to see if uh, in interfering with the inflammatory cells will have a, a change in the rate of progression um, of disease. So the bottom line I think is, is that most of the trials that we're, that we're, that we're looking at now in the, in the New York area is really focusing on trying to um, slow down or mitigate the, the inflammatory response that we think may have some um, contribution to the variation in disease progression that we all see and we don't quite understand and we're hoping we're going to be able to understand it better after these trials. So I think I'm going to end there. I think our time is up and I'm not sure if we can get some questions before we have to end. Great. Dr. Ling, thank you very much. Um, I don't know, my video's not on yet. There we go. All right. So, Sarah, do you want to start? I know we had um, we have a couple of questions. Um, Sarah, you can go ahead and start. I know there's one that came in from Keith in the, on the app. Sure. So our first question here is, why can't you use the ALS scorecard instead of placebos? Gotta take that, Jinzy. The ALS, the ALS scorecard. Yeah. So, the um, the it, it's true that often the regulatory authority in different regions require control concurrent controlled trials. So that means usually a placebo controlled trial. Many of the trials that look for efficacy use them. So often we can use things like scorecard or even predictive algorithms and use an open label. So one of the studies that um, Dr. Lang just presented, um, AZT is an open label study. Um, so in earlier clinical trials in phase one and two, we can sometimes do that, but the later clinical trials um, that are in phase three are looking at, at a, a potential confirmation of effect usually require a concurrent control. And, and that can be um, designed in a way where patients can either be enrolled into, a, in a, into an open label extension if they complete or randomized where it favors treatment. So two to one, three to one, four to one even. Or um, more recently, there have been a push to do a time to failure event where if there is disease progression, people can be migrated into an open label extension in a blinded fashion um, so that everybody gets exposure to an investigational therapy. But it does, at the end of the day, I think the patient perspective is, um, is, is very important in terms of clinical trials and what's meaningful and how we get to that answer. So there are patient advisory committees that are now informing many of the clinical trials that are either investigator-sponsored or uh, industry-sponsored. And uh, the final design usually does need to be vetted by the regulatory agency within that region. And so that's sometimes the limitation. Great, thank you, um, Nancy. Um, I'm gonna jump in with one. Uh, I, we're gonna go back and forth because we have a couple coming into the chat. We just wanna let everyone know who's viewing us this evening. We have until 7 p.m. So we sh hopefully will be able to get to all of the questions. Um, the next one, I guess, uh, Dr. Lang or Jinsi, if you wanna take it, is do you see the platform method being utilized more and more as the pipeline continues to grow? I think I can take that one. Mm -hmm. And so the, um, the platform trial is, is a design in such that um, definitely uh, compounds that are orally taken and targeted specifically for sporadic ALS, uh, and it fits in that, in that paradigm, would likely uh, benefit from being tested in that way. But not every drug is going to fit in that uh, platform design. As you heard, there are gene therapies that are specific for targeted subpopulations of ALS, there are intrathecal therapies that are cell-based that that are in, that are given. So, if we're giving routes of different routes of administration, even IV therapies you've heard about, they may not be been, they may not be ideal to enter into the platform trial. But there are many many um, early compounds in preclinical development that might fit into that paradigm. So, just to test them and see if we can get the efficacy quickly is is the goal for those. 
and people going into the platform trials have to have to be uh, uh, ready to be randomized to different trials as well. So you, it, it makes it a little bit difficult to try to to try to uh, understand the mechanism of action uh, for any given trial. If you just it, so that's one of the problems with the platform trial is you just you 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 go into a trial not knowing which one you're going to get. True. Right. Thank you both. Our next question we have here is, why didn't I get into a clinical trial and can I appeal? So I can, I can, I can start that. I know I, I, I get the hard ones. Um, no, I think uh, that's a fair question to ask. Um, and it's really important to ask it of the physician that helped you screen for that study. Now, what I, I would say is that um, if you've tried to enroll in a clinical trial and, and you didn't meet some preset eligibility criteria, remember that some of these trials, it's not the physician who's actually interfacing with you that designed the study or designed that eligibility criteria. Sometimes the sponsor or the manufacturer of the drug has said it. Sometimes the um, a main center or organization has said it. Um, but it's important to know that if, depending on what it was, the whole purpose of screening and be, becoming eligible is to look for a, a group of people that it would be safe for them to enter. So we're trying to make sure that liver is functioning okay, kidneys are functioning okay. And often there is a time of disease course and breathing requirements that are, that are set. And it's really to see if they, that function, people who are early, we keep them early. We're looking to see if we can keep people in that early state a function um, often for a lot of these um, clinical trials. But if if there was some potential reason that that person or you didn't you weren't eligible, it's fair to ask. And often there are opportunities to rescreen. Um, so it's important to ask that question. And certainly, I, as a clinical trialist, I've had people either um, have trouble meeting the respiratory requirement for breathing or had an abnormal lab value. And I'm able to bring them in quickly, repeat a test measure, or rescreen them. So I think it's important to ask your um, physician who provided you that opportunity to see if there's opportunities for rescreening. Can I, I just add another concept, though, is that one of the things I started out with saying is, is that the trials are really experiments, and we're trying to answer a question. And unfortunately, at the moment, we don't have really good biomarkers to try identifying to identify who has what type of disorder. And there's a, no question that we 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 are dealing with the amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. It's a, it, 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 ALS is not a uniform diagnosis, and I think we all know that. And so the problem is trying to when you when you compare two groups of populations in response to a therapy, you really we try to identify the most uniform population we can. And, and again, it's, it's engaging in an experiment with us. Um, and, and that's why we, you know, we need to have and try to define the best population and most uniform population we can. Dr. Lang, um, I'm going to combine these two questions. Um, I think it can go to any one of the three of you. I don't know if you want to jump in on this one, Jill, um, but I will read them. Um, so it's from the same person. So uh, will my doctor help me figure out which trial is right for me or do I need to do this myself? And then part two of that, can you participate in more than one trial at once? Yeah, I can I can start, but I'm not the doctor in the room. So, but yeah, I, I always rec we always recommend at the association to talk to your doctor about what you're eligible for. Um, I think what what Jinzi and I talked about with the clinical trial match um, on Niels.org is a really nice starting point, and Carly's also a resource. But the, your doctor is your ultimate main resource to understand what you're eligible for. And, uh, like Dr. Lang said, and Dr. Zin Dr. Andrew said, there's a lot of trials that there that's happening in the New York area. That, and the good news, and if you live in this area, there's so many. There is a lot of options, more options than you would have if you lived in somewhere in, um, let's say, North Dakota. So I think we're you're in you're in good shape at least location wise, um, and um, you can really spend some time with your doctor um, figuring that out. Yeah, I can I can uh, speak, and maybe Dr. Lang can pick up the. Um, 
when there's multiple clinical trials, I think it's important, uh, as, as um, Jill mentioned, to speak to your physician because there's a couple of factors that go into your decision making um, that people have come back to me and kind of summarized. Um, and so one of which is sometimes people will consider what phase the clinical trial is in. So is it phase one? Is it where there's a lot of risk and we don't know what the safety is? Is it phase two where it's been studied in a lot of people, but we don't know if it has an effect on your disease? Or is it phase three where we have a pretty good assurance of safety, uh, but not entirely, and we're trying to confirm an effect? The second um, decision maker is um, the route of administration. Is it oral? Is it IV? Is it intrathecal? And along with that is how often do I have to go to the center? Um, so sometimes it, it could be difficult for people to get out of the house or try to get to a center that's in the city. Um, and if it's something that can be done primarily at home, you know, people like that. Um, I think also the people ask about mechanism of action. You know, is it a drug that affects the actual nerves that are dying or is it the muscle or is it the nerve muscle junction? Or is it a target that's specific? Is it a drug that specifically targets my gene mutation that we know is associated with ALS? And so those factors are really important for people when they make a decision. The last item that I'll say is that um, safety. So sometimes there are some medical conditions. So some investigational products, for example, that I might be running a trial that makes people's blood sugars rise. That's the nature of the medication. So it might uh, exclude patients who have diabetes because it would make your underlying medical condition worse and dangerous. And so in, the, in those situations, there might be a choice of not taking that particular drug, but looking at something else. And so those are some of the decision um, criteria, I think, that people talk about when they're making the decision. I just want to add, the first thing I tell anyone that's, uh, that's thinking about entering a trial is, is to answer your question directly. I, I, I will not and cannot choose a trial for you. Uh, I can tell you the pros and cons. Um, I can tell you why we're doing it, what best fits your life. And, and the, the bottom line is, is that the trial should, your life should not revolve around the trial. The, the trial should be enhancing your life and you should want to participate in it, but, but you, you, you got to live your life. And some of the trials are very aggressive and some, some they're, they're very time intensive. And, and so you just have to rec, you just have to reconcile that with, what what your daily activities are and and it really should blend with your life not control your life i would i would also like to add that um, the second question about participating in two clinical trials typically um, we do not allow a participating in two concurrent clinical trials because at the end of the day we all want to we want to know whether a drug works or not and whether it's effective and if if people are on two concurrent experimental therapies, and should there be an effect, we, we can't really clearly see which one it is. Um, so that makes it difficult. However, I will say that um, for ALS, if you're going to participate in a clinical trial, almost all of them allow you to be on standard of care, which means that um, usually there's a requirement if you're on Relizol or you're on Radix, however you're on both, you can still screen and be eligible for a clinical trial, and you can take that as background therapy for most clinical trials, maybe not all. Thank you. Our next question here is, which trial is concentrated on liver function? Hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'll be the first to say I'm not entirely sure, but um, that question might be dancing around another topic where um, we do focus a lot on liver function um, because really Zol, which is commonly prescribed, can irritate the liver. And the liver function is sometimes has to be normal for people to enroll in a clinical trial. Um, and, and because the Rilizol can irritate the liver, uh, we need people to be on a stable dose and demonstrate that the liver is behaving normally in the setting of Rilizol before we add another experimental drug. I think that's the only thing I can say about liver function. Um, there's another one in the chat. I'm going to jump in on that one. And then um, we have one on the app one is, is there a trial that explores psychological sources? And if so, are there any thoughts on using psychedelic drugs? Like, I believe it's uh, psilocybin, it's present now. Um, I, I don't, do you know, I don't know. Anything. So um, 
I can say, I'm, I don't actually, I'm not aware of psilocybin. I do know that there's some preclinical work being done on ketamine um, and, and whether that has any benefits or not um, is unclear uh, in human populations of ALS. Um, but psychological sources, I mean, that's a broad question. And so I think the only other thing I can add is I do know that there are people looking at a variety of interventions that can help provide psychological support. So it's not necessarily interventions for the disease itself, but it is thought, and this is you know, from my personal experience, um, people who, are, who have good emotional health uh, seem to have good overall health and seem to do a little bit better. So every time I talk to people, I talk to people about taking care of their emotional and physical health. Some of those psychological interventions include counseling, in, uh, including palliative care earlier, in, in the multidisciplinary care. So there's research on that and there's research on using virtual reality um, in terms of uh, reducing anxiety or stress levels uh, during the course of the journey of the disease. There is there's some uh, uh, um, ideas about using other types of neuromodulation as well. Uh, we have, and one of, one of our uh, uh, efforts is to try to use uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation in, in not necessarily in in a psychological well-being, but but it could very well translate into that. It, it, our study was designed to see if it would enhance cognitive function, but there is some data to suggest that just uh, TMS in and of itself can neuromodulate and improve depression, improve you know pain, and and that may be an avenue in which uh, we will find some different results uh, uh, using a different type of uh, intervention. Thank you, Dr. Lang. Thank you. Uh, and our next question on Huba here is, are the physicians running the multidisciplinary care models kept informed of local trial objectives and recruitment opportunities? I can take that one to start. Y yes, uh, so we have uh, care leads all over the country. Uh, and, and Tracy's been involved in that, and Teresa at the, um, and others at the Grenier chapter. Um, we meet with them monthly. We um, inform them about trials that happen in the area. We have a lot of different relationships with all different pharmaceutical partners from very small startups to preclinical to like the big ones that uh, Dr. Anza talked about, like such as Biden. So we work really hard to make sure our, um, our clinics are, are aware of things happening in their area. Um, in addition to the companies themselves reaching out, you know, it's not, it's the, the company's primary job to do it, but we're always there to help to make sure if there's something that um, comes up that we, that that's happening in their area, but we don't favor one company over the other. We just give the information as we get it and move, and move it forward. Great. Thank you, Jill. Sarah, do you have a, um, more questions coming in? Yes, I have another one here. Uh, and I think this definitely was discussed, but maybe we could just expand upon it again. Um, how do I find out about current trials and their criteria? I can start because Dr. Ann just keeps talking. It has a lot of, it has had to keep talking. <laughs> so I can start, <laughs> Dr. Lang. Uh, so, Go to um, neils.org and if you click on the tab clinical trials, you can do a search, click search for clinical trials and you can either search by keyword if you know which trial you're looking for or you can go to an advanced search. Um, I like to do that because then you can click down on your state. Um, and so you click on New York and you click on enrolling and that would then set out a list of really of what's happening in your area and that information could take to Dr. Andrews or Dr. Lang and ask a bunch of questions about eligibility. In that, if you click on the trial, there is some initial information about eligibility. Um, I don't think sometimes it's the most lay language for, um, for people with ALS and their families. So that's again, where your doctor can come in to really explain to you what everything means and then whether you fit and if it's something that fits your lifestyle, like Dr. Lang said. I think that's a really good point. Um, and then, of course, we have Carly Allen. She's our, our concierge of clinical trials, and she can call her, you know, with anything, and she's just fabulous. So I really encourage you guys um, to reach out and use that resource. Um, Niels works really hard to make sure that's up to date. And, um, it, and you know, I can tell you for sure it is. It's up to date. So thank you. Thanks for that question. Definitely um, check that out. 
thank you so much. Uh, and our next question here, keeping track of them coming in from both places. Um, with gene therapy, how close are, are we for C9 or SOD1 to treat these? Yeah, um, so I, I think the most mature program is the topersin program. That's the antisense oligonucleotide gene-directed therapy towards SOD1. And it is in what's called the pivotal phase. So that means that there's a confirmatory study that's fully enrolled and planned to complete this year. And if that is that demonstrates efficacy, then it will likely head to the FDA for review and, and become available should it show a positive result. The C9 uh, programs are a little bit uh, earlier, and so they're in phase one. So the Biogen program that's currently ongoing is really trying to understand what the ideal dose would be to carry forward in a pivotal uh, phase. There was a press release for the um, for the less common G mutation FUS uh, that announced that Ionis was uh, going to launch that clinical trial, and that requires the FUS mutation, um, and that will be an international study. And although it's a first, it's an unusual design because it's uh, based on uh, the experience in the community for the C9 and SOD, it's, it is a first in human phase one study, but it's, it's designed with the intent that should it show results, it would um, be considered a pivotal study. So it kind of, I think the gene therapies have challenged traditional clinical trial design. So outside of ALS, um, usually uh, programs will go through phase one, phase two, phase three, but considered the urgency of some of these genetic forms of ALS, uh, the regulatory authorities and the FDA have really considered ways of trying to be flexible for those specific programs, especially for fast progressing disease. Um, so uh, again, the SOD program for Terpersin is more is mature. Uh, the C9 are a little bit earlier. And the FUS program is announced is also first in human, but considered to be um, a pivotal phase study. Jenji, can you can you uh, address what how important is it that the genetic identification identifies a more uniform population that so that so the the, the numbers can, might be able to be smaller and and the. Uh, therapeutic effect might be able to be better defined with smaller numbers of people because it's a. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, that kind of goes to uh, what you were talking about earlier about having the same type of people being evaluated to see if a drug has a positive effect. When we're talking about genetic forms, although that's less in number than, say, sporadic forms that are not associated with gene mutations, the gene mutations, usually when people come in as newly diagnosed, we do screen everybody um, that come in, whether they say they have a family history or not. But once you identify a population with specific, so in SOD, there can be different types of mutations, and certain types of mutations are associated with faster progression. And in that Topherson study, the effect was really seen in those patients that have the SOD mutation with specific that are specifically associated with fast progression. And when you have a group of people with an identified target um, with a similar feature, um, because ALS is different from person to person, you have more of an effect on a drug because you have you know the target, number one, and number two, your population is progressing at a similar, similar rate similarly. So um, that way you anticipate a larger effect. So you don't need such a huge study. So the Valor study is about 60, six zero patients. You know, as opposed to other clinical trials in ALS that we've done one as large. Remember, uh, Dr. Lang, we've done one in dexamethasone with almost a thousand people internationally. So um, that's important. And I think I should just mention here. I'll just throw in very quickly uh, when participating in a clinical trial and after going through the whole process, a lot of people ask me how much it's going to cost. And um, I think it's important for people to know that um, coming in for a screening visit and trying to see if you're eligible for a program. It doesn't cost anything out of your, it shouldn't cost anything out of your pocket. Um, and it, it's usually uh, funded by the sponsor or the uh, funding agency. And usually the tests and the assessments and the drug is provided to you at no cost and it's not charged to your insurance either. Um, so that's one of the uh, things that people commonly get confused about. 
But I just wanted to make a, make a point that the, 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 the SOD1 mutation and the C9 ORF mutation, depending upon what it is, is really a biomarker. And we have a target, and as Dr. Andrews just said, that if we have a target, we can we can divide, we can design a specific treatment, and that is why um, uh, trials like the Anexon trial, which really is 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 a very heavy biological trial, but we're trying to find neuroinflammatory markers that correlate with disease, so that we have a target, so that we can develop drugs for that target, uh, as opposed to simply trying to change the course of the illness and and. And it, 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 the, the better to find the target, and cancer studies show this, the better to find the target, the better it is, the easier it is to identify a therapy and the more likely success will occur. So we do need a, a strong effort in trying to identify better biomarkers that segregate the different um, per rates of progression. Thank you. I see we have two more questions here, which it looks like we have just enough time for uh, to wrap up with. So our next question, um, we just came from the session on gene testing. Do I need to have that done before trying to enter a clinical trial? That's a good question. <laughs> you, you've said repeatedly that that, uh, that you test for, for um, genetic uh, causes in pretty much everybody that comes into your program. And I, I just want to echo that the, the same, that that I, I think that because of the targeted therapy that is potentially available for people with with uh, uh, known uh, genetic mutations or genetic causes, that it's imperative that we, we know that that's off the table or on the table at the start. It's not a requirement for most trials and uh, that, that I know of. Um, but but it, it but I think it's it's a requirement for good clinical care. Yeah, and I I, I will say there, there's a little loophole here. So um, you know we uh, we all I think at our centers have have the ability to kind of um, approach people living with the disease that are newly diagnosed to do the genetic testing. Some people might not have had genetic testing, and and the time window for enrollment might be short. So I have to say that there are some studies uh, that target genes that will allow you to come in for screening and get the genetic test during the screening for that specific study. And that would be covered under the, the grant or the funds that are provided for that clinical trial. So if it's an SOD1 trial, they'll test for SOD1 specifically, but not maybe not for the other genes. Um, so that's, that, that is true. Um, but in essence, understanding your genetic information empowers you to make the best choices for um, how you treat your disease and also what experimental therapies that you would choose. Thank you, Dr. Andrews. We had one more question that came into uh, on the Whova app. I think it'll be the last one we have time to get to. We have a hard stop at seven. So I'm going to just put it out there and, and um, hopefully one of you <laughs> will grab it. Um, can anything be learned from the mRNA technology being used to develop COVID vaccines and how can that be applied to ALS research? I can take that if anyone feels shy. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, Dr. Andrews. Yeah. Only because um, I feel like somebody planted that question because the, um, the look. It wasn't me. Know, we, no, so the quick answer is obviously Operation Warp Speed was used and it was a collaborative effort by the agency, by our regulatory authority, the FDA, by drug sponsors who were, pre, who were competitive with each other. We call it in the pre-competitive space, they collaborated. And the technology already existed, and we knew what the offending agent was, the virus. Um, so they had some advantages compared to us in ALS. And so that, that drove some of the speed. And of course, the number of people that were affected with COVID were far larger than the people um, affected with ALS. And so that drove an advantage to study some of these vaccines faster. Um, with that said, uh, I did actually reach out to several people who have worked on Operation Warp Speed, and uh, there is a um, webinar through the NEALS uh, educational webinars that are funded by the ALS Association that will come out on uh, actually tomorrow. I think it's at 11, uh, 11 o'clock, but it will be archived. And I did ask one of the people who worked on that, who was a bioethicist, to explain how the, um, the COVID vaccines were developed so quickly. Um, and and what what are the things that we could use in ALS and what may may not be so usable? Um, you know, it's essentially I asked her to speak about where's our operation warp speed for ALS. 
Um, so there are some things that we certainly can learn from it, but we, we have some handicaps here um, that we're trying to overcome. And, and Jill talked a little bit about participating in observational studies, giving your samples for research to understand and develop biomarkers. These are all tools that can help us get to a meaningful treatment faster and, and just learning about it. So just being here empowers us to do so. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to all the doctors um, who presented to us tonight, Drs. Lang, Andrews, and Dr. Jill Yersak. Thank you all for being with us. Um, we got to all the questions. It was fantastic. We really appreciate you um, taking time to present to us. Thanks, Docs. Thank you, Sarah.